Yes. Well, I don't know in the back. Um, and they can they can decide if they want to use those or not. But I'm Meg Hewitt. I'm one of the co-creators of this SDR Meetup experience that you guys have come to or are starting to come to. So welcome if it's your first time, and welcome back if it's your second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth time. This is our sixth meetup that we've had. So um, it's been going really well, and, and we continuously bring in new content you guys, if you ever have ideas of things that you're looking for or interested in hearing about or learning about, let us know. We're very open to suggestions and feedback, so definitely give us that as well. Um, so the topic of conversation today is mastering the sales conversation. So we have Kyle, who is our moderator today, and he is a manager at Mass Mobile. So He'll be leading the conversation, and then we have Mary Ann, who is a sales coach at the Flora Group. So she'll be introducing herself, and both will be, and they'll kick it off. Uh, other than that, we do have a couple sponsors. First of all, Smartling, this beautiful face that we have here. We've been so lucky. <laughs> years, worked for some of the most successful in the tech companies out there. Um, you heard of Yext? Yep. Single platform, huge spread. I was an SDR manager there, and I just recently joined a company called Mass Mobile. And short story, we are displacing the, the, the guest phone, because it needs to go away. Um, we found by the guy that <coughs> sold Virgin Mobile to Richard Branson. So, very young company at this point, but it's going to blow up, so I'm really excited about it. Uh, so, I'm in a growth role right now. I was previously managing SDR at Cube 8. Um, I was the first SDR at Newstread, then we you know, grew and raised $90 million and all that stuff. Left to do consulting, started my own company called Prospect Exam. You might have heard of that as well. Um, consulting and like data work and all, all those things. And, um, but now I'm in a growth role, which is like sending tons and tons of, of emails and just trying to fill the, the top of the funnel as much as we possibly can uh, with a very lean team at this point. So they kind of hired the, the manager before. Anyone wants to learn more about how those processes happens to I'll ask you a question. Have at it. Can I ask you a question? You got it. So, um, could you use a microphone? Sure. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Is better? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so, that's from my background. And then we're going to listen to Mary Ann. Hi, everyone. Uh, Mary Ann Bolzani. I've been in sales over 20 years. Launched my own sales leadership coaching business. I've been doing it for about nine and a half years now. I've worked for startups. Mm -hmm. I've worked for Fortune 500 companies. Um, I, in my sales and leadership coaching business, work with all different industries. My background is in the media space. So I started out in print, and I spent the majority of my career in the online and digital space. Um, in my coaching business, I work with all different types of industries. Um, so I've worked with folks in aviation, fashion, technology, you name it, it kind of covers the gamut. Because at the end of the day, what I find is that um, it's always two people sitting across the table from each other having a conversation. And so I don't come in as an expert around your specific industry. Uh, I come in as an expert. 
turn around how to have a more effective conversation to get to the truth quicker, sooner, faster, so that we can move that deal on or and forward to a close or move it off and get someone else to vent. So that's me. My two boys. <laughs> my oldest is going to turn 14 in a couple of weeks, and my youngest is turning 11. So uh, I'm a kid to Jamie. raise years. Yeah. <laughs> yep. um, awesome. So, yeah, I think a good way to, to kind of, you know, um, follow up is just kind of ask her some questions, and then we'll open it up to the floor at the end, and feel free to, to fire away, like, you know, she's very knowledgeable, uh, really reputable, so um, come, come with questions, and, you know, she can give you five minutes Yeah, so. there is nothing you can ask that I have not heard, yeah, or so we'll go for it. So I think, let's start out with, like, the, the negative aspects of, like, managing the, the conversation. Um, so even like pros can get can get flustered when they're trying to you know, basically this is an SDR meetup. So when we're talking about the conversation. It's it's really about cold calling, right? That's that's what that's what this is about, uh, and just trying to get as many prospects interested uh, in your product as, as possible uh, on the phone, which is incredibly difficult. We all we all know that. Um, so where do you think cold calls typically go wrong? Being cold. That's a great point. Yeah. So, <laughs> it should, it should be more <laughs> That's right. So there's. Uh, okay. <laughs> so it's the wrong person. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So like lack of research, essentially. Right. Or just you know you do a lot of research, but that person doesn't do that well. Yeah. Okay. And a lot of times these guys won't tell you who to call. Sometimes they will if you can connect, but other times. You'll call an organization and you'll get the wrong guy or gal. Right. And you know, you'll just be a dead end even though they could be sitting next to the person that's the right person. Sure, I love that person. Thank you. Mary, I'm Richard, what are your thoughts? So if we identify it's the wrong person, I don't think that's wrong. Identify it, move on. If there are ways if they're the wrong person to ask for the correct person can't do it, move on. Um, the way to have a most effective cold call and cold outreach is just to make sure that you are saying something that matters to the person that you're reaching out to. What I most often, so I have the blessing and the curse of seeing sales folks emails all day long. It's part of what I do. I look, I critique, I give them new ways to write their outreach to get responses. And the, the thing that we do most often is we talk about all of the great things that we do and we think that they'll think that's awesome too. And we don't talk, we don't frame our value in the context of their world. So the question you have to ask yourself is, of what I just wrote here, what of any of this matters to the person I'm reaching out to? And if you can't put yourself in their shoes and see what would trigger them, then you haven't done a good enough job of potentially saying something that matters to them. Not what you think is wonderful and great, but why is all those wonderful things great? Why the heck would it matter to me? And I find most don't do a very effective job of creating those triggers that put the context of the value that you all bring into the buyer's world. I was gonna, I was gonna say that the problem with the no cold call is by its nature, you have to introduce yourself and tell them who the hell is calling you. Sure. And that, that means you're talking about yourself instead of talking about them. Sure, I mean, it's okay to say, I'm Mary and I'm reaching out from the floor group. And the reason I'm reaching out is based on what I know about your business and what you do. And others we work with in that space, we help them do these three things. And it might be relevant. If any of those are important to you, it might be relevant for us to just have a quick call. So is that how you think the flow should go within a cold call? Yeah, I think you should definitely introduce yourself so that you're letting them know who you are. Um, you always want to tell someone very quickly why you're reaching out. So I'm reaching out open to a quick 10 minute call. Tell them a little bit about what it is that you do and talk about it from experience. So others we work with, maybe it's a similar category, a similar industry, and how you help them. And usually like two to three things, we help them drive revenue or drive, engage, reach, whatever those things might be. And then I usually say if any, and if I'm reaching out to the right person, one or all of those things are gonna be important to them. 
So if any or all of those are important to you, it might make sense for us to just have a brief call if nothing else. So I, the first outreach should make it super easy for them to say yes. I think we often make it way too complicated, <coughs> excuse me, and way too difficult. So, excuse me, are you actually asking for permission after you continue to decide? So asking for permission to go further and give them an opportunity to say yes or no? Uh, it, this is in a phone call. Yes. Oh, okay, so I was just, what I was referring to was more of a cold call, a cold outreach and email. Mm -hmm. So in a cold, um, if I'm picking up the phone, I want to not assume that they're going to talk now. I would almost say, are you open to you know, calling from wherever? It's almost the same dialogue. And I'm reaching out to see if you'd be open to putting 10 minutes on your calendar at some point this week. You if they say they're willing to talk right now, great. Have you always sent them an email first? Uh, I typically find that cold outreach, if you start with an email first, it gives them some context. And it also, gives them some sense of who you are. It also gives you leverage, right? Because uh, I'm reaching out because I sent you two emails. Like that's mm -hmm. super valuable initially. You have um, a, a trigger for you to reach out to them yeah. and call them. I think, um, I, I think for, for me, what I've, what I've learned uh, with cold calling is it's really just about managing emotions, right? Like when you first get someone on the phone, they're they're just ready to get to hang up on you. That's they're looking for a not so rude way to hang up on you, right? And if you could just talk to them like they're your friend, then you can get them to begin to do what, what we call like active listening, as opposed to just trying to wait until you stop talking and then you know weasel their way out. Right? The way that I've coached my teams before was, I would say, like, you want, if you notice in every single friendly conversation you've had, pretty much in your life, there are kind of, like, two how are you's when you introduce yourself, or when you, like, you know, engage with a friend. It's like, hey, man, like, how are you? Good, dude. How are things? You know? Like, it's, it's, it's emotional intelligence. That's what, that's what it comes down to. Like, your ability to disarm. And then after that, it's like, all right, so what's up? Yeah, just uh, following up a couple emails, love to you know get a little bit of understanding as to how you're managing X. And it's a very broad, open-ended question. And it, obviously it's very much targeted at what your product offering is, right? But they're gonna talk about what they care about most initially. So, I mean, you don't have like a, a script per se, you know, it's, it's very open-ended, but if you can get your prospects to harp on what they care about most initially, then you can frame your product positioning the, the proper way to ultimately convert them, right? So I think an open-ended question in the beginning is so crucial. And once you get past that point, uh, it's really just about positioning your product the right way and, and then closing it, asking for the official email. Yeah. So if you don't I mean, that is the rapport. The, the two how are you's are like so the rapport. Do you, do you find that you have to kind of let one lay out before you ask for them to share very you know, deep problems? That, how can you get to that point? Yeah, I think um, what it comes down to is you just want to uh, be able to settle them, mm -hmm. right? And approaching them like a friend and, and like a, a conversation they've had, like a, you know, a Sunday night or Saturday night when they're just out or something, mm -hmm. um, is, is really valuable, right? I think you you, you just, they're, they're already settled that, at that point. You don't need to like build more rapport with them. It's just like, all right, what is this about? You know, because we all want to be efficient here in these conversations. So that's, you just, you just get to what, what you're asking about and they'll, they'll open up to you because you seem like a genuine human being. I think yeah. one of the huge issues when it, uh, SDRs will just go into their pitch and not let the prospect talk that much. And it's like, uh, it comes off as extremely disingenuous. What if the prospect doesn't want to talk? Like, oh, literally okay. they pick up the phone. Here's what I would um, answer is a little bit, adds a little bit more to, from just from my experience and a little bit to that. Um, when you get someone on the phone and they, let's say they agree from an email to talk to you to schedule a call, or let's say you call them and they say, I can talk for right now for 10 minutes. So what you want to make sure to do to put someone at ease is they want to know what's going to happen in the next 10 minutes. 
So I don't, at a human level, I don't, I feel like you might harm me. You're gonna make me do something I don't wanna do. I'm unconsciously thinking about that. That's what a buyer thinks when a seller is coming at them. And so you just wanna tell them, in the next 10 minutes, great, we have 10 minutes, here's what I wanna do. I wanna ask you some questions first, so I get a better sense of what's going on for you. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about who we are and what we do. And then at the end of the 10 minutes and the end of the 15 minutes, we'll figure out or we'll have identified what the best next steps are. And we say, you know, Joe, does that sound good? And Joe's gonna be like, Leah, that's great, let's do it. So you, it does two things. It puts, it minimizes your nerves of, oh my God, what if this goes down? I don't know what's gonna happen. Because you've, you've taken control of that 15 minutes and you told them what you're gonna do. You have a plan and you get their buy-in to agree to doing exactly that. And now you're having more of a conversation than you performing. Because in sales, we perform. Like they'll say, as you said, okay, I'm here. What do you guys do? And what we do automatically is we perform. And that's where we fall into that trap. And we don't learn anything. We didn't ask any questions. So by framing out what's gonna happen, you're guiding that. They're buying into it. They're saying, great, let's do it. And now you can ask questions first. Because you always want to get your prospect to talk first before you just start spewing all your great information. Because when they tell you they're in some pain or they're saying yes to all the things you do, and then you can add value to it, I call it taking the anchor. It's harder for me to say, Leah, go away, because I just told you I need all that, and now you guys can do that. your hook and then I'll decide if I'm going to give you a minute or not. So, you know, you go into that like performance mode. So, let's How do you like Let's make the situation worse on? by saying <laughs> Let's say like they the prospect picks up the phone, are you trying to sell me something? Right? That's the, one of the worst things you could have gotten, right? So, you guys have a pen. Write down I I'm just trying to get your feedback. I am just trying to get a better understanding as to what your business processes are. Something like that. And then you can go into, like I sent you a couple emails, just quickly following up, I'd love to get a better understanding as to what you, know, you <coughs> bring your value from that way. Um, and they'll open up to you. It, it's actually kind of shocking how much they open up. I, I've, had, I've had like 10 minute, 15 minute cold calls before. And to be transparent, that's really long. You shouldn't talk to someone for for 15 minutes on cold call. It just shouldn't happen. Because like, you know, you're, you're a nuisance in their day. <laughs> right? Because um, the goal is like, get in and get out. You know, you want uh, three minutes, four minutes, maybe. Right? Because uh, you don't want to oversell your product before an AE gets on the phone. So that's the idea. Make sense? Questions? Yeah, I was curious how to even consider that one step further. How do you get them on the phone in the first place? How do you Would you say if I asked you all, is your process, does it sound something like this? You call, you email, you email, you forget about it, you email, you just sort of move into stalker mode, then you like let a lot of time go by, um, and then you just get excited. Yeah. So it's highly scientific. I'm sorry? It's highly scientific. Yes. Would you, as by the giggles, I sense you've all done some version of that? Yes. So, um, You've gotten in people to respond that way, so it's not that it's, you know, no one's gonna respond, but it's very out of control. You're completely out of control. And so what I work with groups on is having a process to actually get more responses. So I either get yeses or no's, and being okay with getting the no's, because no, no's don't mean no forever. Sometimes no is your timing's not right, or no, I'm not the right person. So my approach is to get the truth and to get a response as quickly as possible. And so that process would look something like, uh, let's say I email first to introduce, to see if they're open to talking. Three to five days, if I don't hear back from them, I send another email. 
could be an email or a phone. You could do both. Uh, and you're, you're not re coming up with a whole new set of things to say. You know, I reached out last week and wanted to send another quick note regarding X, Y, and Z. Are you open to talking for 10 minutes? And then if I don't hear from them again, in three to five days, I have another touch point. And that touch point, I usually sometimes give them an out. So I'll say, you know, if, if you are open to talking, let me know. We can put 10 minutes on the calendar. And if for some reason this is not the right time, that's okay. You can just let me know either way. That third one tends to be a sweet spot. People need, it's not that what you're saying is not good. I'm sure if I got my hands on, we'd clean it up a little bit. But it, it, most often salespeople think we're saying the wrong thing, so we keep trying to say something new and different and more exciting every single time. And they don't remember, and it just sounds like someone new reaching out. What I want them to know and remember is I've been reaching out, and I've been reaching out in a very polite way, in a very business-like way, and I just asked them if they'd be open to meeting. And you will get people responding <coughs> with, I'm sorry, I apologize, yes, let's talk, yes, I want to talk, the timing's not right, or you might get, no, it's not the right time, I'm not the right person, so you will get more responses. Send me an email and or a call and have no response. Yep. And then you recontact the person on the phone and you get them. And you say, I do not do that. We haven't had a chance to resolve it. Thanks for having me. I'm pretty sure you do. No, I definitely refer. So the voice mess or the call, I look at it as a touch point. So at any touch point, I'm reminding them. So if it's a second, you know, I emailed them and now I'm calling in three to five days. I would say, I reached out to you last week via email. I don't know if you had a chance to look it over. It was with regards to X, Y, and Z. And I thought I'd take the call to see if you know, you're know you open to putting some time on the calendar next week. I would I would counter that with, you don't, everyone takes the, the, the path of least resistance, right? If you say, did you see my email? What are they gonna say? No, I didn't, I didn't have time to read it, right? Because that's like the easiest thing to say. Oh no, I'll read the email and then I'll get back to you. That never happens. So the idea is, it's assumptive, right? It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you saw my email, you're really busy, I understand that. Just trying to learn more about this. And then you just kind of navigate your way to, to close. Does that, does that help? So I would, um, if it's somewhere in the middle that might be more comfortable, you can say, I don't know if you've read it, and either way, but this is what it was with regards to. So that way you're telling them what it is versus yeah, that's, that's it just true. minimizes. So what you have to remember is there is a ton of resistance, consciously or unconsciously, when a seller is calling a buyer. My role as a buyer is to resist you. I don't care if you went to college. I don't care if you're married to my best friend. I am going to resist you at some level. And again, it's very unconscious. I'm not going to tell you certain things. I'm going to hold back information. And the seller, we're trying to have them like us. I want you to like me, so we're super nice, we're super friendly. <laughs> and everything that we do, we have to be conscious of minimizing that resistance. So when we play those roles, we lie to each other, we don't ask certain questions because we don't want to be too aggressive, they don't tell us certain things because they don't want you to even take advantage of me. Um, so all of what I'm talking about is to minimize that resistance, get people to respond and tell us the truth as quickly as possible. So uh, in your outreach, are you targeting admins, or you just happen to, how do they come into the- Somebody who's guarded by an admin. They're guarded by an admin. Um, so I would just talk from experience. So you know, I, I'm reaching out to schedule time with Joe, who's the boss, and um, my experience, or, well, let me step back. Are you finding that they're not responding, or they're, they're not setting up the meeting? I guess I'm- Are you emailing the person as well? Yes. So um, I'm okay with, I know most don't like the voicemail, but I think that most aren't going to listen, uh, most don't pick up the phone. I don't know if you find that people are picking up the phone. Yes. Um, so voicemail, I, I, the email, the language is super important in what you're saying in your email. The repetition of the process is important. And the voicemail, utilize it just to humanize yourself. So that they, if they do listen, they hear your voice, you sound real, you sound normal, I can put some context to the email that you've been reaching out. Um, 
but I would pay a little bit more attention to what is it that I'm saying in the context of my email? Am I triggering them with something that's relevant? Am I framing my value in their world? And, and, and am I making it easy for them to say yes? Am I asking for a two hour meeting? Am I asking to meet for an hour? Or am I just suggesting a quick offer? I'd say for ad news, I take two different strategies, and you can use one after the other, which the first is just be as vague as possible. Right, hey, I'm just following up a couple emails, I'm sure you got them, can you, can you like put me through? The, the key is to like ask them closing questions, every single, like almost every single time. Like, yeah, can you put me through? Oh, uh, well, yeah, it's been through right now. Well, I mean, I just, you know, I'm just following up a couple emails, haven't, haven't heard from him, uh, is, is, it, is he like available now? And then you can just kind of keep pushing in uh, then there reaches a point where if this is a, a true buyer for you, that you need to be more friendly with the gatekeeper. And I mean that we used to do these things like called dynamic outreach, where we would send uh, like a prospect of ours like something cool in the mail, like snail mail. It's actually really effective. Um, we saw some like great social media buzz from it and stuff. We had like a, a CMO of White Castle or something reply to us at that point. It was super super upset. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, you do some research, you figure out what happened. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, I'll get you <laughs> and you do some research to figure out like what to send them. But I think I say if it's if this is truly a fit between two companies, there's no reason you shouldn't be doing tactics like that. I had a question on cadence. Thing. Yeah. Like as far as you know, what, what, what are you seeing that works? Is it like a nice easy cadence, like? You know, the initial email, two, three days, cool, ping again, that sort of thing. Um, do you find that front ending it, you know, works better, or you know, building up more momentum on the back end, um, or is it like a nice even every couple of days, just sort of, you know, reaching the right? The first email has the most. It's, it's the chunkiest of all the emails. It's I mean, you want to keep it short and sweet, but it's the one you're. They have no idea who the heck you are, so you're telling them a little bit more. The subsequent ones are short and sweet, so they're you're keeping that initial one below it. And really the intent, you have to remember, if the intent is to get them to respond and see if they're open to talking, make sure that you keep asking that same question. So in the first one, if I'm introducing myself and I'm telling them a little bit about who I am and others we've worked with and we're doing these things, and my ask is, are you open to a quick 10 minute call to explore? And I don't get a response in three to five days, I might say, I sent you a note last week, so I'm wanting to send another quick one. Are you, you know, with regards to X, Y, and Z, are you open to meeting for, or talking for 10 minutes? And so they'll refer down below, right. but I'm reminding them that I reached out, making it very easy, because I'm thinking, oh gosh, this person reached out, what is this about? And am I open to talking to them? So my, I guess my question really more towards frequency. Yeah. So in terms of like, so the first email goes out, great, follow up two, three days later. Then yeah. it's like the, ba the balancing of, of being pleasantly persistent to carving over into really fucking annoying. Like, sure. where do you sort of like, when do you, you when do you stop? Right, and, and do you is it do you find that like a more even frequency seems to work, or do you find maybe back ending it with a few more, you know, shorter, quicker pings works? Um, just want to know like what you've seen. So the process that I find works and it works is four touch points, and you know, the first one introduction, three to five days is your second touch point, three to five days is your third. That's typically where I give someone an out, where I mention you know if. If you're open to talking, let me know, we'll put 10 minutes, and if for some reason this isn't the right time, that's okay, just let me know either way. And then the fourth is what I call the going away or the closing up the loop. That's where I close up that process. I stop at four touch points. Some go five, cool with it, but after that, if you've been reaching out to someone for a month, and you've given them the opportunity to say no, and you've made it easy for them to respond, and they're not, I'm just gonna move on. Doesn't mean I'm not gonna call them again, doesn't mean they're dead to me, but I'm just gonna move on for a little bit. And that closing up the loop is the most uncomfortable for sales folks mm -hmm. because what it sounds like to me is I'm giving up. I'm saying goodbye too early. What if I just did it a few more times? We were just talking about this earlier. Um, what it does, and I promise you if you get comfortable doing it, it you will get more responses I always say 50% of the time, my clients say it's way higher. So it's probably you know, closer to 75 or 80% of the time, people will respond. They'll apologize, and us in sales never get apologies for anything. They'll apologize, they'll, you'll get yeses, 
I closed deals where I've closed up president of companies at least two or three times and I've closed business. It's just because they're busy and got other stuff going on. Um, and you'll get no's, and you'll get some that won't respond. Move them out and move on. So that fifth one is more like last, like sort of apologies, you know, this will be the last one, just let me know if you're- Fourth, like, fourth. Fourth one or fifth one? Yeah, fourth or fifth if you want to go fifth, five. I usually go four of the month. Uh, it would sound something like, hi, Joe, you know, I've reached out a few times over the last month with regards to X, Y, and Z. I'll assume for now this is not the right time. And if I'm mistaken, let me know. And we can certainly put some time on the calendar to talk. And then I wish them the best. Happy holidays. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Whatever it is, just some kind of nicety. And then I move on. So I make an assumption. I let them know I've been reaching out. And for now, I'll just assume it's not the right time. But I do let them know if I'm wrong, let me know. We'll put, we can put 10 minutes on the calendar. And then so, when, do you, when does that revisit happen? When so, do you You want to give it at least um, four to six weeks. Give it some time for something to change. Because then you can reach back out four to six weeks, things could change, you could start over again. If you can give it longer, give it longer. But if you can't, four to six weeks. So the uh, last sales meetup, SDR meetup, we had um, a cold email person yep. who suggested that you should send a, a sequence of eight emails okay. to try and you know create a positive response and that would comprise, you know, just emails, not even phone calls. Sure. Yeah. Great. So uh, I don't know what their methodology <coughs> is, and if it works, then if eight works for you, go for it. So I can only talk from my experience. Um, I do think that if you think about eight, it's two months. I'd want to, if, if I were to look at that, I'd want to see, well, what are we saying in those eight emails? Um, are we are we really being very effective? Are we asking good questions? Are we making it easy for them to respond? Uh, I think that you could take eight and potentially condense it. That said, I don't know enough, and if eight works for you, you know, keep doing it. Uh, I always say to people, if anything I say is different than what you have found to work, keep doing what you're doing. In terms of numbers, how many conversations a day are you typically having in an SDR world? And of those, So define, define conversations. So a, a conversation <laughs> where you've got somebody to speak to on the other end of the phone, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Is there 20 of them? You literally got through to a human being that you could start a pitch to. How many of those a day on average would you say an SDR is doing? So I mean, there's a couple of different ways you can define conversation into an email. No, no, he's, say, he's voice, a big yeah, yeah, so, uh, it's voice, 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 voice to voice. Got it. Um, I would say, like, you should, you should get four or so conversations in an hour, right? I mean, that's, that's if you have good data. I mean, data's everything, right? If you, if you have direct lines, it'll significantly increase your, your ability to get people to pick up the phone. So, I mean, do the math. What's your rate of, let's say, so you're passing these to an AE, I'm assuming it's been qualified, and, and you're qualified in June, which let's say it never is, but you're, you're passing those to the top of the funnel, which an AE is then picking up, I'm assuming, downstream. You've done some qualification, right? So, I mean, ideally, many, ideally uh, in your process, your like lean research process, they would be buyers. Right? You would be able to identify this is a buyer of my product okay. before you reach out to me. That would be ideal. And then, so what percentage of those do you think actually get passed off to an AE to then follow up on a more direct sale? Is it 10%? Is it, what's the? Of conversions, conversions, of like positive conversations and meetings set, uh, I would say, I mean, all, every, every single conversation that you convert should, and you should be, you should be talking to people that aren't qualified in the first place. Well, because of conversion, right? You're, you're going to have 30 phone calls a day, but right. five of those will get converted to follow-up calls that are yeah. engageable in terms of a, a, an AD, let's say. Right? Sure. i got to believe it's five or 10 out of 30 max. It can't be 20 out of 30. Right, right. right. So you're saying, like, what is the conversion from connection, like, at the, during the call, right. to actual meeting book? Right. 
Yeah, I say five or five so. Or so. If you're if you're really hitting the, the phones hard, like all day, you can get five. Um, that number is, as we've seen in, in the industry, just plummeting um, because people are moving their their work phones and all those things a lot. Wait, less. say that again. They're just people aren't picking up the phone because right. yeah, it's not. I mean, not us. Yeah. So how are you getting four people to pick up a phone in an hour? That's my question. A day. Uh, so no, you said in an hour. Oh, in an hour. I mean, like, if you're making 60 calls, yeah, the assumption is that you can get four people to pick up the phone. But pickups don't don't mean conversions. That's how it works. What do you do with the rest of the hour after you do 60 calls? <laughs> 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 Reaching out and connecting side, and then there's really the in mail side. Yes. So you're saying how to utilize that, how best to utilize it? Yeah, how do you guys best utilize it? Um, so the, the thing about that is you, it's harder to do that process that I talked about. I think that in that space, it's a little bit more invasive, sort of a bit more annoying to do that process. So it makes it a little bit more challenging to do those multiple touch points which the multiple touch points are just to remind people. They forget. So we remember that I reached out to them and that I want them to call me back, but they're not thinking about us. So the multiple touch points really help. So if you have no other avenue, if you don't have an email address, you don't know how to reach them, and you want to utilize the in-mail or LinkedIn, go for it. I mean, I do it, and you certainly can get people to respond. Um, it's just more challenging because you can't, it's, it's more difficult, I think, to do those multiple touch points. I personally, this is my sole opinion um, based on you know, experience, I, I don't find LinkedIn to be very effective in terms of emails. I think it puts you in a bucket of like recruiter. Uh, I think uh, decision makers don't really check LinkedIn messages. Uh, I barely check LinkedIn messages. Well, they usually have sent you. If you hook it up right, it's right. Oh, that's true. Uh, <laughs> You'll look at that later. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would focus, what I would focus your energy on when you go back and you look at your emails and your outreach tomorrow, just look at what the heck am I even saying? In any of these touch points, what am I saying in my email? And is my language and my outreach effective? What am I saying in my email? Because you can get responses in email. People get them, people get them on LinkedIn, senior people write back, but what is it about what you're saying? I would focus on that. You know, you can change up and if you find one works better, of course, do it. I think if you're going to look at your cold outreach and how to get it to be more effective, look at what, what am I saying and what's that process that I'm taking them through. Voicemail. Uh, when do you uh, leave a message and uh, what do you say? So uh, let's say I, I use the phone as one of those touch points that I talked about. So it might be I sent them an email, maybe it's my second touch point, I may send them an email and then leave a message, or I may call and say, I sent you an email last week, just, send, just thought I'd give you a quick call, I don't know if you had a chance to look it over yet or not, and of course you're going to have more details about your business, I have no idea where you work, so I'm being very generic. And then I just say, you know, I'm going to send you, if, if you're open to talking, you can call me or you can reply to my email, and then you can send an email as a follow-up left you a message and wanted to send another quick note. Because typically they're going to respond to you in email, not picking up the phone and calling you back. We have to keep the intent the same. It's no different when you get on the phone. So you prepare a little bit more when you're emailing. You look at it 10 times. You look at it 100 times. You erase. You write it over. Voicemails, we just pick up and we're like on the fly. So you have to do the same thing. Be a little bit more thoughtful about before you pick up the phone. What is it that I'm going to say here? Keep it succinct and still have that very same clear ask that you would ask in an email. Do you have uh, best practices for good effective subject lines yeah, for email? Sure. Um, <laughs> I often find that I ask myself, what is my intent for reaching out? And I let whatever that answer help drive the subject line. So one of the most common things <coughs> that I'll see in subject lines is we often put our company and their company name together. Um, if you're doing more mass, you're probably not doing that as much, but if you're doing it individually, 
is that if you sew together there's a big heart around it and there's feelings. <laughs> Everyone does that. So if I'm a buyer, all I see all day long is my name with all these vendors. So just think about what your intent is. If it's to see if they're open to talking, <coughs> that could be your subject. 10 a.m., are you open to a quick 10 minute call? Um, if it's a different intent, it's are you open to exploring? Um, what that does is, so a lot of what I do is I focus on the psychology side of things as well as the strategy. And so on the psychology side, it's how people interpret our information. So the, I want the filter that they're thinking about the moment they open it is, am I open to talking to this person? I need to know who it is. And so they're reading it, deciphering, am I open to talking to them or not? So you have a higher probability of them. They're reading it in that manner, and you have a higher chance of them agreeing to it if it, if it makes sense. Quick, quick question on next generation SDR techniques, right? So let's say phone and email the meetup, the next generation of prospecting, where we're back almost full circle 100 years to face-to-face -face engagement as the place, it's the, it's the only way to get through the filters will be face-to-face -face again. And is the meetup perhaps the next generation of prospecting tools? I, I don't like me. I don't get it. I mean, this is more of a rhetorical. Yeah, I know. I, I'd say, like, um, I, yeah, channels are becoming much uh, harder to, to, to actually engage with prospects um, on. I think the, the, one, the one channel that performs pretty consistently is email. Uh, it will get harder because there are many companies playing the numbers game. And prospects will get smarter as to whether this is a canned email or not. And it's already starting to happen within the space. And it'll be interesting to see how the, the space um, pivots. And, and I think we'll probably go back to more like snail mail. I'm thinking Vine and Snapchat. <laughs> social selling. Social, yeah. well, it's, it's a next generation of social selling. Well, it is. And it, 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 again, it's getting by the not only the, the administrator in the office, but the actual person's attention span is the biggest gatekeeper as well, right? Which is, people need new ways to engage that are meaningful and compelling. Yeah. Technology, especially mobile devices, <coughs> make opportunities like Vine and Snapchat, for example, which are now starting to emerge as prospecting platforms. People are starting to master the use of those platforms as ways of getting people's attention. Because you've got a short, it's designed to be a short bite, right? To get somebody's attention. Is this an area do you think that's gonna, some of this new technology is kind of guerrilla tactics around SDR development. Has, has anybody really mastered that space yet? Or is anybody thinking about that space from what you've seen? Or is it still the traditional you know, voice, email? Because what I'm hearing here is those are plummeting in their effectiveness. And there's gotta be a next generation that's gonna be driving that growth with new technology beyond yeah, phone and email. I might, one of the things I, I mean, that would be like, I think, a fascinating topic and one that we'll actually want to dive into. Um, because I do think there's some really interesting technologies, some different methodologies that are coming online. Things that I'm actually seeing that uh, some really innovative startups and vendors are sharing with me. But yeah, I'd like to be able to focus this conversation really just on the, com on the conversation that we have right now in terms of channels. And actually, one question I had that was really kind of top of mind recently was this idea of like call scripts. There's like this whole prescriptive notion back in, you know, back in the old days when I was selling in the old school enterprise where you get to script everything out. Then everyone said, no, you can't do scripts. It's totally, it's too, too prescriptive. Now I've seen people going back to scripts. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? What, what, do you, what do you find effective? Absolutely. Um, I think it depends on your, your market. Uh, if you're at the SMB, like you have that thing optimized to no end. Right? You know what works and, and what to take care of uh, to, to the absolute T, right? But if you're the enterprise and you're selling into you know, VPs of marketing, VPs of sales uh, at the enterprise level, like they have so many different things on their plate and it's really hard for you to identify like what they care about at that moment. Um, so I think a framework is, is crucial. You have to have a framework, but a script is just gonna make you sound robotic. It's gonna make 
you just come off as you know as as if you're you're controlling the conversation, which isn't always uh, the best tactic, especially when you're when you're doing cold calling. Um, it, it's more uh, about just having a good solid framework that's going to lead them down the path that is favorable to you. You know, is there is there something that you found that's worked for you to help kind of either open that door or deal with that scenario? And then the other one is um, when you get someone on the phone and they they want to pass your information on to the person. They they don't want the, in both yeah. scenarios they're not revealing who the right people are. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you're asking them. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and they're well, um, I'm not sure who. It might be one or two people. I don't know. You know who I'll pass your information on or. You know, I'm really not sure. You know, that's sort of like the, the responses that come back, and it's like, okay, like how do you like continue? How do you keep the conversation going and not just okay? You know. So I usually try to make sure to tell them what you're what you're going to do with the name, okay? Because they feel you're just going to stalk their their boss, right? So or their colleague mm -hmm. or someone else in a different department, and they don't want to be the one to say, oh, I gave them your name. Right. So to tell them what you're going to do with it. So I understand you're not the correct person. It would be someone in your marketing department. Would you be open to sharing who that is? And what I'll do is I'm going to reach out and see if they'd be open to having someone in the conversation that we just had. Mm -hmm. and are you open to sharing who that person is? Okay. So you're telling them what you're going to do. You're going to email, and you're going to see if they're willing to have a conversation as well. Okay. If they shut you down and say, no, you know, I'd rather just, if you could send it to me and I'll pass it along, then I would just ask them, would you be open to me following back up with you in another week mm -hmm. to see if they got it, and if, if at that point they might be open to having a conversation? Um, when we started, one of the guys over here, I said, you don't do a cold call, you do a warm call, and someone said, you've got to do research. And to bring it full circle, I would say, chances of having success in your email campaigns, email slash voicemail, is if you really have worked hard on your ICPs and you've worked extremely hard to know who you're actually supposed to call, who their title is, and you've ser done very serious work. I mean, the scattergun approach will get you no place um, except th sending out thousands of emails. So we had a whole discussion here on ICPs, and I just take us back to that, that ICPs are critical and really doing your homework takes you out of the realm of the scattergun approach, which is what so much of this stuff has always been. That's right. So uh, I have a phrase that I've always coached and sell people on, and I get a lot of resistance, which is slow down, team fast. <laughs> so exactly what you just said is you need to, it might take a little bit longer. You might not get as many people that you wanted to reach out in a given day, but if you have 100 good, solid, and the right folks, and you're targeting the right people, you're going to have a higher response rate. So you may not reach out to as many people, but if you slow down to reach out to the right people, you're going to see a higher response rate. And so I've seen this with a lot of SDR teams because there's numbers that are driving us and metrics, which are great and I get it, uh, but they often can become the driver for what we're doing and we don't take the time to slow down to reach out to the right people. And you will definitely see a higher response rate if you slow down in that process. Yeah. Have you ever tried to enable traditional sales force with SDR-like techniques, so as opposed to having a team of SDRs with an SDR manager, have you ever tried a distributed approach? I mean, so I work with, I predominantly, I probably work more with the AE level, um, more so because more teams are developing SDR teams, it's becoming, definitely becoming more popular, so I'm seeing that with a lot more of my clients, but everything that I just talked about right now, you could utilize at any stage, at any point in a sales career, so it could be the AE, it could be I work with senior leaders. It's all the same stuff. You could use any of what I talked about today in <coughs> any conversation to get a response from someone. Husband, boyfriend, mom, dad. I mean, it's, 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 it's you and me. It's always two people. We forget that. We get so caught up in our world of what, what it is that we're doing, we forget the human element. If you can just show up a little bit more authentic and a little bit more real, you get a little bit more authenticity and a little bit more realness from the people on the other side. So, 
about 20 goals. We have two minutes, so we can take two more questions. Got it. Again, I couldn't. Like, if you just drop first names, like, it's a good way to just make them more comfortable. That, you know, if you could, I, I, you know, hey, I, I reached out to Tom, you care, I reached out to your senior vice president, Tom Brass, you know, he's been, you could say, hey, I'm talking to Tom Hilder. Maybe you should talk to my board now. You're bullshitting. You're bullshitting. Yeah, so uh, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, no drama mama, no bullshit mama. Like, There's really, the 
it's a cliche to say, but there's two types of salespeople. There's ones that are uh, evangelists, and then there's ones that are just, uh, I call like the, the hardcore, gut through it, uh, classic kind of sales, uh, sales type, if you will. And the difference is, is that when you're selling something which is a commodity, like you just don't want somebody who follows the script. The script works. Right? And there's lots of industries that I can cite where that type of salesperson can be super effective on numbers. Think about people who sell insurance or financial planning. I mean, that's all methodology. Like you don't deviate from 100 calls a day. So that works. People who, don't, people who fail are people who just don't do the work. But then there's another type of salesperson that's more about evangelizing something, something that's new. Uh, I had um, the folks up in Boston in my meetup, Andrew Quinn, who does, does all the sales training for all the salespeople at HubSpot. They need evangelists. You know, particularly when they're early on, back in 2008, 2009, they were selling something which was completely new, or, or very new to the market. So they need someone who's more creative, more on the fly, more willing to have conversations that were outside of a you know, quote unquote script. So, yeah, I mean, there are different types of salespeople. But I think it really comes down to like those types of a very clear delineation between kind of the commodity sales and the evangelical sales. Right. And I'll, I'll leave with Marianne and just close out. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, so I, 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 um, I think that from a psychology standpoint, if we can care for the other person on the other end, mm -hmm. we're just always thinking about us. Um, so I don't know if anyone has read Emotional Intelligence. It's a great book to read. Um, it, it, I think the more that we can care for the human element and not get so caught up in getting the sale done, you will actually close more business because you are caring for the other person and what's going on for them. Mm -hmm. um, everything that I coach and teach, what we talked about tonight, is really just to be a little bit more real and authentic. Be you. And the more you you are in those conversations, the more curious you are from a mindset perspective, where you're asking good questions and you're genuinely curious to understand what's going on for them, and you're guiding the process, you will you will get the truth. And ultimately, as sales folks, rock star salespeople know how to get to the truth very quickly. And the truth is not always going to be what we want to hear. And if I'm attached to only getting the yes, I'm do not ask certain questions because I don't want to hear the no. So I would just practice just being a truth seeker, just trying to be bold and direct to get to the truth.